So tonight we're going to be talking about victory, but I also need to maybe just put some across that victory in God's sight is not the same as victory in the world's sight. You see, a man dying on a cross to the world looked like failure, but to God, that was the greatest victory that's ever happened on this planet. It wasn't a tragedy that Jesus died, it was an achievement because he set his face like flint and he was going there deliberately. And there were going to be no, I mean, people think the devil crucified him. If the devil really knew what was going to go on, he wouldn't have done anything. It'd have been pulling the Roman soldiers away from him. But Jesus went straight there. So victory, in a worldly point of view, may be different from God's perspective. I read some recently and it really got me thinking. And they said this is a great miracle to get saved. But it's just as big a miracle for God to keep you saved. And I thought about that. He then rephrased it and says, most people think you only need power to get saved. God gives us a power to live saved all our lives. So John, 1 John 5 says this, starting at verse 1. Anyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the father loves the child as well, his child as well. This is how we know what love is. Uh, that, this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. Probably going to talk about this next week after that bit. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is a victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So tonight, if you're a Christian, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you've given your life over to God, surrendered it all to him, then actually it says that you have overcome the world. Kind of weird, really, when we don't think we've overcome the world because we're still looking at things from a worldly perspective. Because we think if we overcome the world, that means everything will be at peace. There'll be no trouble if we overcome the world. Yet, the Bible says that if you want to live a godly life, you're going to have trouble. How's that one? How's that a victory? Well, it is on God's side, but it's not always on man's. You see, we, we need to line our thinking up with the word of God so we know what victory really is. I've, I've pinched these title headings from Charles Finney. I mean, he's not a bad preacher, is he? I mean, if you're going to listen to anybody, he's not a bad one to listen to. Well, you can't actually listen to him, but you can read up on him. Um, so he's listed a few things. and it's, asked, it's actually one of his sermons where he's asking a few questions, and it's the questions that I've pulled out and thought I'd develop it. So Charles Finney actually asked a question, what is, it, what, is it, what is it to overcome a world? And I brought this down to several things. You know, to overcome a world is to overcome envy. To overcome the world, in the context of part one, is to overcome envy. You could call it covenantnessnessnessness, but I can never say that word properly, so I called it envy. Which is actually in the heart of every man on this planet, every woman. Anybody who's not saved, they have this heart of envy. It's okay, you can have the latest phone, the best one going, and then they bring out the next one, and somebody gets that one, and you're envious. Now, I've got an iPhone 6, and I'm happy. So someone laughed at it, and said, what are you poor? That's what they said to me. And I was just happy that I got an iPhone 6. I mean, it's little better than an iPhone 5, and it was better than the phone I had before that. But I was happy until somebody said, what are you poor? And they poked me in the eye. Because he had his iPhone 10 or 11 or whatever it was, with his iPad and his Mac there, saying how it streams it all together and it flicking it. I thought, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's just something, something rose up in me, which wasn't very tight. <laughs> e. I don't get envious of most of those things. Dot Martins, I might. But the Bible says this no temptation has overtaken you except which is common to man. And God is faithful, He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, it will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 
The word tempted there is the same word as tested, and they're interchangeable. You'll put it in whichever way you want, but whatever's happening, if you're tempted or tested, it will not overcome you. But your testings are only common to man. You know, it's no different. I mean, I was talking to a, a guy who was talking about how the fact that he's tempted by another woman. And so I said, well, it's easy to get around that one. Tell your wife. She'll sort it out for you. But it's not uncommon. <coughs> you know, some people think that their, their struggles and strives in life are kind of unique to them. Well, actually, no. It's the same as everybody else. We've all had to go through different stuff and different stuff. You know, that's the first part of overcoming the world. The second one is overcoming the world actually implies that we can rise above sin. It's an interesting one. Not only can we deal with envy and not be envious, but we can rise above sin. Some people tell me they can't, but the Bible says this. That, this is Romans 5, 17. For the sin of one man, Adam, caused death to reign over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace, I like that, and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin. So if you become a Christian, you receive the grace and the wonderful gift of righteousness from God. And he said that you've received it and you will triumph over sin and death, but, but through the one man, Jesus. So you'll triumph over it. And he's not talking about having a motorbike here. You're talking about you will conquer it. Yeah. So when sin comes snapping at your ankles, you have a choice. I would rather not have the choice. I'd rather it happen and then I sin and I could go, oh, I didn't help. I couldn't help it. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when I sin, it was my choice. But I don't like that. Because I, you know, before God, I don't have a condition anymore called sinfulness. I've got a condition called righteousness. I can't blame it on, on my whatever it could be. You know, I, I got up this morning, Lord, and I put my t-shirt on backwards, and therefore I've got a condition, and therefore I couldn't help. We haven't got anything like that. We don't have a get out of sin free card that we can wave at God, but God says this. Because of what I've done, you can rise above it. How do you stop yourself sinning? Well, David puts it this way, I vid I your word in my heart that I will not sin. Interesting, the word sin means to fall short. So David could be saying, I've hidden your word in my heart so I don't fall short of your standards, fall short of what you have for me, fall short of your blessings, fall short of your goodness, fall short of all the amazing things that are out there for me. But it sums it up in one word saying sin. But we always see sin as negative, and it is, but it could also mean that we've fallen short of the amazing blessing and plan that God's got for our lives. That's why David says, I've hidden your word in my heart. So see, we can over <coughs> overcome the world, can imply that we, we are not overcome by fear. We're no longer a slave to fear, because we are a child, children of God, or a child of God, as I say. It says this, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, I think Andrew's going to unpack this at some point. It says, for we have not, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. As a young kid, I used to um, do what could be deemed silly things. Because sometimes I needed a bit of fear to make me feel alive. It says, I used to rock climbing. You know, when you're 40, 50, 60 foot up a cliff and you're clinging on with your fingertips with no ropes on and fear starts to come in, you've got to get a grip on it. I used to walk home at the age of 12 from one village to the next. I had to cut across. I could either go the long way around or I could walk up these old railway tracks in pitch darkness, which were okay until you met somebody coming the other way and you scared each other. <laughs> I don't know about you, but we used to go in houses, you know, old derelict houses with the gangs of us and you'd wind each other up. You get going, it'd be dusk, and you know, the darkness is starting to set in, and you'd be scaring the life out of each other. But in one sense, it made you feel alive. But God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. What He has given us is power, love, and a sound mind, or self discipline, depends on your version. He's given you the power, His love, and He's given you the ability to actually make sound decisions. So, overcoming the world is we can overcome envy. 
We don't have to give in to sin. We can add, we've not been given a spirit of fear. Another way of overcoming the world, it implies that you know, we don't have to live as the world lives with anxiety. You could say worry. But it seems an increasing amount of people are living quite anxious lives. And the Bible says this, it says, don't, you know, be anxious for nothing. I like that. Be anxious for nothing. Do you know that in the Bible, if the Bible says do not, do not, it gives you the choice to do it or not to do it. To be or not to be. That's a question. To do or not to do. If I had a skull, I could talk to Yorick. <laughs> you know what I mean? My Shakespeare is only limited. I struggled with English, so Shakespeare was well out of the way. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and, put, and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. So instead of getting stressed out and anxious and, and chewing off your fingernails and ripping out your hair, this is because I've got too much testosterone, not because I worry a lot. We can just bring it before God. Now the problem there is, some of us, and some people, like to worry. Because to hand it over to God means you're not in control of it. At least when you're worrying about it, you think you're doing something. I mean, at the end of the day, if worry could solve anything, we'd have solved all the problems of the world by now by that worry some people have. And I know that some people have you know, serious anxiety issues and it works out physically into their bodies and it can cause you know, like sickness and things like that. But the Bible says, don't be anxious for nothing. Give it to God. Give it to... Uh, if you've ever been a parent, a grandparent or an uncle auntie, you're trying to help somebody who's little, a little child, and you want desperate to help them or they've got a problem, you say to them, just give it to me, I'll sort it out. And they go, no. I'll sort it out myself. Sometimes you've got to go, fine, get on with it. I'll come back later. And they're still struggling. Because even something built into every one of us is, I've got to sort this out myself. And yet Jesus says, you know, lay it down. Take up my yoke. Take up my burdens. Care for what I care about. And see your life change. So the next one is victory. Having victory implies that we cease to be enslaved by the bondage of this world. Living in victory, we're no longer bound by the... You know what? It didn't concern me too much about who won the election. Because I serve a greater one. It doesn't bother me now. You know, about whether America assassinates somebody or somebody assassinates an American... Because... My life and your lives are in God's hands. Amen. Not in somebody who's got an itchy finger. Somebody who's got a lot of rhetoric. The good news is that whatever happens on this world... See, we're crying out for revivals. Yet where revivals are, there's usually trouble. Yeah. Oh, we don't want the trouble, but we're revival. Do you know Israel prayed for hundreds of years to have their own land? And it was only after the worst disaster that it bails people that they got their own land. Through the Second World War, the Holocaust and all that stuff. When one out of three Jews were murdered, and then even England got involved afterwards with the political stuff, but then they got their own land. God always brings good out of the bad for those who trust him. He always takes the mess and makes something amazing out of it. The Bible says this, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus. I like that. Because I know that I'm not going to inherit much from my dad. Probably debts. I'm not going to get notes from him. You know, I do tell him to spend it anyway. But I'm an heir with God. And everything we do down here... You know, it's, it's good to have a pension. It's good to have things set up in place for, for later on. But we need to be investing in the kingdom to come. <coughs> investing in the future. We might have 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this planet. But we've got eternity. I mean, what is 100 years to eternity? Not much. So invest <coughs> forward. 
So the second point, we've gone A, B, C down to E, but now on the second point, who are those that overcome the world? Well, we've already read, those who overcome the world is everyone born of God overcomes the world. So, if you're born again, you're already overcoming the world. Well, I don't feel like it. Again, you're thinking like the world instead of thinking, actually, I'm a child of God. Now, this shouldn't make us have a superior attitude. Yet, inside, we are superior. Not mother superior, but we are. You know, we've got the spirit of the living God living inside us. Who rise and raise us up. So that's us. That is you and me. So in Bible, in Revelation, when they read, To those that overcome, I will give. Seven times. And, and people discussed them and debated them and preached on them about, Why well, are you an overcomer? Are you somebody who overcomes? And it's always put guilt and condemnation, but according to John, and I'm actually one of those people who believe that John wrote Revelation first, then he wrote the Gospel, and then he wrote the letters. Because of the order of things and, and the terminologies, and as it goes into the Greek and stuff like that. So I think he wrote the book of Revelation, and in there he says eight times to those that overcome, and then he wrote this letter and thought, I better let them know who's the overcomer. Uh. You are! <laughs> Woohoo! So everyone's a believer, you've overcome! Yes. So when you read Revelation, next time it says to those that overcome, I will give you, because that's me. That's me. I love that. I love that. Can I have some chocolate with that, God? That's me. And you can just take it from there. Take it in the Word of God. So, why do, do believers overcome the world? Well, John 16, 33 says this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. So he's telling him what's going to happen. In this world you will have troubles. <laughs> That's not encouraging, is it? In this world you will have troubles. It's like sending your kids to school going, when you get to school you're going to get bullied. It's going to happen. <laughs> not nowadays, but it did in my time. But take heart, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. So Jesus said, you're going to have troubles, but take heart. See, this is the difference. Uh, I'm going to have trouble, but take heart. In fact, Jesus says, trust in God, you know, trust in me, trust also in God. Trust in God, trust also in me. You know, we need to trust in I found these verses. Do you know what? I've read this loads of times, but I never really, it just dawned on me today. Colossians 2, verse 9 and 10. It says this, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus, 100% man, 100% God. 100% God, the Trinity, everything, the whole thing of God, into a man. You get into it. And it says, in Christ, you have been brought, uh, brought to fullness. I don't feel like I'm fullness. But it says, you've been brought to fullness. He... He is the head over every power and authority. Amen. He, that is Jesus, is head over every power and authority. Now, I don't suppose he's meaning end power or the local authorities, but he's saying I'm over every power and authorities. Yes. And if I didn't, you know, last time I checked, the devil is one of the authorities. He's one of the powers. So Jesus is over them. So when he says take heart, we can take heart because Jesus is over everything and we are in Christ. Yeah. Now, let's not get too carried away and say, well, that means I'm over the devil. Well, actually, in Christ, you can stand your ground. Amen. You can use the word of God. Yeah. You can take authority over situations in Christ. So on to point four. We're skipping, but I don't know whether we've got... We're on point four anyway. How is this victory over the world achieved? Well, through Christ is a simple answer, isn't it? But, <laughs> but Charles Finney says this. It says, believing in God having, and having a realisation, impressions of his truth and character made upon our minds by the Holy Spirit, given to those who truly believe, will we gain the victory over the world? Put simply, you get saved... You get spirit filled, you devour the word of God, you take up the armour of God, you put your dot matters of truth on, and you start marching into the world knowing you've got angels stood around you, the Holy Spirit in 
power in them, fire in you, and passion in, in you, and you go out and you love people. I don't mean the 60s style hippie loving, I mean loving people properly. And that's how you overcome the world. Amen. You love people, you care for people, you reach out to people. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says this, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You've got victory, Amen. but you don't feel like it. Yeah. You're looking from the wrong side. In Christ, we've already won the war. Amen. In Christ, you know, I was chatting with somebody and they've got a, a young child who's seriously ill. And they said, will you pray for them? And I said, I will. And they were in a state. And I just, you know, sometimes, not you guys, but me, I sometimes say things before my mind kicks in gear. You know, sometimes I've said a full sentence and Joe's give me that look before I've realised what I'm saying. You, you know, you've seen it, haven't you? You, you know, you, if you're married, you've got that old look. But it says... Dying wouldn't be such a bad thing. And they cl- <laughs> I was like, <gasps> you Because know? I thought, I'm not, I will, I will pray for life and pray for healing. But that child will go straight to heaven. And in God's perspective, that's a victory. Because if that child grows up, they'll have to make a choice. And they might not. <laughs> And God's perspective is eternal, where our perspective is always temporary. That's why we give in to sin, for a temporary fix in a little situation, instead of thinking long term. In Revelation, I like this, it says this, this is Revelation 12. You need to get to the context of, 11, of Revelation chapter 12, it's talking history, but it's also talking future, but it's talking history. He says, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now the salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of the, of the brothers who accuses them before God day and night has been cast down. That's past tense. Because when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, that's when he was cast down. He has no place in heaven to stand anymore to accuse us. In that sense, in fact, we are getting on to another sermon. He doesn't accuse us before God now. He accuses you to you. And he accuses people to you. He whispers. Because whenever he stands, he goes before God, he says, they're mine. They're washed and covered by the blood. And it's been cast down. And they overcame it by the what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to, unto death. Yet, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you will dwell in them, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having a great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. He's angry, he's annoyed. You make him sick. When he looks at you, he's angry. Don't think he's actually trying to have a picnic with you. He hates you. He's trying to kill you, destroy you. He's trying to pinch everything from you. The NIV version puts it this way. They triumphed over him, talk about the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much to shrink from death. We talked this morning about death as a Christian. It's been laying our lives down on the altar, laying our lives down, living sacrifices. We die daily, we take up our cross and we follow him. But we overcome him, that is the devil, by the blood of the lamb. That's what Jesus did on the cross. That's everything he did, plus the word of our testimony. Amen. Your mouth is a powerful sword. And you testify to all the goodness of God. And when, when the devil comes or the minions come at you, you can say, I'm covered in the blood Amen. and I can testify of his goodness. Amen. I don't know much sometimes, but I know he's a good God. Amen. I don't know much, but I know he's always going to be there for me. And whatever lies come, you can say, you know what, I don't know that much. But I'm going to trust him anyway. Yeah. And sometimes that's all you can do. Yeah. And by just saying, I'm trusting him, you're winning the victory. Amen. Sometimes all you've got to do is be the last man standing. Yeah. Just keep standing, keep walking. Yeah. Eventually, you'll either get there. 
Oh, it'll pick you up and take you there. <laughs> you know what I mean? One of us. So do think, Jesus has done everything on the cross for us, but we still need to have our, the word of our testimony. You've got a powerful, powerful story in you. And your story might be, I was a real bad person, but now I'm walking for God. It might be, I grew up in church and I'm walking for God. And nobody can argue with that. Don't matter what anybody says, they can argue about the Bible. They can argue about the existence of God. They can argue about whether Jesus was real or not. Did he die? Did he not die? They can argue all that stuff. But they can't argue when they see your life changed. They can't argue when they see you daily walking. I mean, I said to someone, why don't you like Christians? He said to Philip, they're all hypocrites. I went, and? I says, so? He went, well, they are. I goes, so? I says, you wouldn't have liked me if I wasn't a Christian. And let's face it, people would probably not like you neither, for you're a Christian. And yet many people do some amazing stuff because they're Christians. Yeah, there's always an odd nutter somewhere, isn't there? You know, there's always somebody doing something and it's making it weird. But at the end of the day, you, can, you are an overcomer. Uh, you have overcome. And whether you're sick or well, rich or poor, whether you, you're walking in great triumph or struggling day by day, you are still somebody who's overcome. Amen. Because in Christ, he overcame. And therefore, you have overcome. And we can overcome a world, but we need to look at things from God's perspective, not our perspective. So be of good heart or good cheer. Ding! Good cheer. Jesus said, I've overcome the world. That's something to get excited about. The beginning of this year, this decade, this month, this week. And go out and just be an overcomer. -er. That's not even a word, is it? But I say it, I keep using it. Overcomer. -er. I don't know whatever the other thing might be. But anyway, be a good cheer. And walk in God. Amen. Amen.